Our gathering today is being sponsored by the fine folks at Broadcast Depot. Mary uh, is going to try and be here, uh, but she's in uh, flight. In... I'm here. Come I'm on, here, hi there. It's noisy. It's noisy. Well, we're glad you made it. I'm at the airport. And um, that's good. Uh, so do you want to mention something here? We have RVR as your special uh, deal for the day. And uh, Tim tells me that you have a big stock of 30 watt and what is it? 300 watt with the uh, digital stuff in there? Yeah, with the uh, telemetry. So we've got those in stock. And I think we have, I think we still have a couple thousand watt ones. Uh-huh. So okay. uh, a good solid box, not all the bells and whistles of some of the other companies, uh, no audio processing. Uh, it does come with RDS as an option. So, so those good, are backup, good backup transmitters, good for a low power situation if you don't have the funds for some of the other big boys. And you have several things that are all modular and uh, interesting. Tele it's the telemetry series, I guess, of your software. That's all pretty yeah. nice. Correct. Correct. So, and RV RVR does uh, antennas, combiners. So they don't just do transmitters. Now, RVR is an Italian company. Uh, most Correct. of us know. And so, uh, Mary, uh, talk to us just for a moment about how you handle uh, requests for information or service? Well, well, given that we're the master distributor for RBR, we're responsible for handling, handling support, repairs uh, in Miami. Um, and we do a pretty good job of it. Unfortunately, you know, with COVID, we've had some issues with parts off and on. But I, I'm, I don't think that they're alone in that. I think there's some other manufacturers that had has had the same situation. So, but you call Miami and get a U.S. person that will support the product. We do repairs in Miami. So, so to sum it up, you you call Miami and you get an English speaking person. You you call me and you get an English speaking person, but yeah, oh. there there are there are several in Miami that that speak English. Okay, so. well that's great. We appreciate that. We appreciate Broadcast Depot uh, helping us out here. Now today, look at that. There he is, Kurt Gorman. I finally corralled him, and he has uh, agreed to be here today. And uh, there's a lot I want to Kurt to talk to us about. Uh, not only just uh, today's topic, which is uh, diplexing, triplexing, multiplexing, but we want to talk about antenna maintenance, phaser maintenance, and even uh, the concept of looking at your uh, directional and seeing what can be done to improve it. And uh, Kurt's got a lot of experience in there. And so, uh, Kurt, we'll uh, turn this over to you. And if you want uh, questions to be held to a ter certain point, uh, we can do that. Folks can raise their hand. And uh, or use the chat box, and we'll let you uh, start out. And if you'd like to uh, grab the screen and uh, present to us, please do. Yes, can you all hear me there? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, and if we have any questions there, feel free to you know stop me along the way there. Happy to try to answer any questions I can as we go forward there. All you have to do is press your space bar or alternate A to unmute. I'm muted or no, no. Anyone that wants to ask oh, you a question. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so I, I guess as Barry mentioned there, especially in the AM world these days, it seems like I wouldn't say 90%, but a good bit of our work the past few years has been combining sites uh, for whatever reason, whether the property has been sold or a uh, station has lost their lease and has to move to another site. Um, that's becoming a popular thing as far as trying to combine, well, at least two AMs. In some cases, we've actually taken where there's been two AMs combined and have added another one there. Um, some of these have been, you know, just a single tower, non-directional. In some cases, they've been a directional where we've 
made either the multiple frequencies directional or we've actually taken and put it a non-directional and used one of the towers of the directional. Um, but a lot of those things there, uh, I do get a lot of questions from people concerning some of the prep work as far as kind of trying to decide whether or not a diplex situation can work there. And that goes to a number of different things there. Uh, first being, you know, looking at it from an FCC allocation standpoint, because I get people that, you know, they may be moving a short distance, only a few miles, but the station where it was currently licensed, you know, was boxed in and had a lot of grandfathered overlap. And when they even just move a few miles to another tower, they may have to reduce the power a decent amount. So one of the, I, I always suggest to people there before they even think about the case of actually moving to another site is first to look at it from the FCC standpoint there and make sure allocation wise it's going to work. And then the next big thing is if you determine that there's a station down the road that you possibly want to co-locate with, a lot of times you have to be very careful as far as what the tower height is or if there's various tower heights on that property um, because the rule of, in general there if you have close frequencies that means that the tower electrical heights are very similar so that has the advantage that the impedances are similar but the disadvantage that the filtering has to reject fairly close frequencies now we've had other cases and we just recently did a few where we've had, you know, where we would take a frequency that's in the upper half of the band and, and add a lower frequency to that. But the big problem, the filtering was not nearly as much of a challenge, but the challenge there was that the impedance of the antenna was real low at the low frequency. And that causes another set of problems. So I do get a lot of people, they, they, they you know, they, especially when they get the manager says, well, we could just move it down there and turn it on. Well, that's not always that easy there. Um, but I think following some of those rules, as far as, you know, looking through some of that stuff there and seeing what's, what you're dealing with, not only from a tower standpoint, but what the impedances are at the various frequencies makes a big difference when we go to design a diplexer or a triplexer, because if we start off, with much better impedances, the end result is going to be much better. Um, so that's a couple of things, and especially with the solid state transmitters that we have now, um, just putting uh, a station near another station where over the years they had an, an older transmitter and they didn't have any spurious problems. I have three or four cases where they've put in some of the new solid state transmitters and now we have spurs being generated because of that so we've ended up building some notch filters there basically just put on the transmitter output there so and and that goes hand in hand with the diplex case because they may be moving to a station that's you know at another location but there there also may be another am that's not too far from that so not only do you got to worry about the stuff that's on the site there but you also got to worry about the, uh, you know, other stations that are fairly close by, especially if you're going to have a solid state transmitter. Um, but that, uh, then the next step there is getting back to that is some of the filter design. We've, you know, I've come up with some different ways where we try to not brute force the filtering there, because the problem with that, especially when you have close frequencies, if you try to brute force and have a lot of attenuation at one location, then you start to have bandwidth limitations. So when we have close frequencies there, I find that by spreading some of that filtering out there, filtering what you need to out at the tower base there, and then putting whatever filtering you need at the transmitter and basically looking at what those voltages are coming back from the antenna to each of the transmitters is probably the most important thing. Does anybody have any questions or anything that I can uh, address so far? I think one of the things that uh, you and I talked about a little bit uh, yesterday even 
is uh, when the frequencies uh, like the second harmonic get very close, does this uh, negate the ability to diplex? It doesn't negate it, but once again, uh, and I've actually had a few cases where our diplex frequency has been on the second harmonic or within 10 kilohertz of the second harmonic. And if you have enough attenuation from the filters coming back and the transmitter output in is, is fairly well suppressed to begin with, usually that's not a problem, but that can make a problem come up very quickly there if things are not uh, set right and you have enough voltage coming back. I suggest not to do it there if they can avoid it, but I find a lot of these cases, you know, people in most cases may or may not have a choice there. There may only be uh, one or two or, or even three stations that even remotely may even work for them. And Murphy's Law will be the one that's the closest to the second harmonic is the one that they can actually uh, work with there. So, um, but it does become a challenge, but I think no matter how, how you slice the diplexing there, the whole key is to keep those voltages out of the, especially these solid state transmitters, because it sure doesn't seem to take much with the, uh, the B, you know, the BEs, the new Nautel transmitters, uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of voltage coming back to generate some of these spurious products fairly quickly there. And you look at, uh, when you have to be, uh, you know, 70 to 80 dB down there, uh, just a little bit of voltage come back there, you, it, that gets to be a little bit of a challenge when you have fairly close frequencies. But it's doable. Last year, we had a station in Provo, Utah there. They had to move, and I ended up diplexing. I designed a diplexer, and I have 1400 and 1450 on the same tower there. And both of those, one runs a, a BE, one kilowatt AM transmitter. The other one is a new J1000 transmitter. And the advantage in that case was that that tower, it was an old licensed facility with a slant wire feed. So the bandwidth, uh, the impedances were very similar between those frequencies. And reactance and resistance uh, was, I mean, within 10, 15 ohms, as you went between those frequencies. So by basically wiping out that reactance before the two frequencies tied together, my filters were looking into pretty much, uh, and the resistances were like 50 to 70 ohms there. So each of the, the load on that uh, combined output there, when we wiped out those reactances there, was fairly close to you know 50 or 70 ohms resistance and the reactance was you know less than 10 or 15 ohms. So in that case there, the voltages were real low at a kilowatt. So if you have fairly low voltages there, then even with the attenuation of the filters, you don't have very much voltage getting back. So I could design the filters with a decent enough Q where both of those modulate fine. And I was a little hesitant at first there, but the, the, the owner had no other choice of where he could move that uh, to. And, uh, when we, I tuned it up for him and uh, actually the performance was even better than I had computed there when I actually measured it there, uh, looking at it at plus or minus 10 kilohertz there. And the, the spurs were all uh, well down below this, the 73 dB or that we needed to make there at a kilowatt there. So that's why uh, sometimes people think that, you know, if you've got wide frequencies, well, it's going to be real simple, but sometimes the ones that you think are going to be simple are actually more difficult than the ones that you think are going to be tough there. And uh, that's why, every, you know, each one is its own different set of problems there and addressing that up front there uh, is probably the most important thing there. But I think getting back to the, uh, the filtering design there, uh, that's the whole key is basically what, when I design the diplexer stuff, I don't really look at powers. I just, I look at voltages there. So I basically determine what the voltage is at the antenna. And then I work backwards and want to try to, you know, get those voltages as low as possible at the transmitter ports there. So you could have a kilowatt, uh, but if you have an eight ohm resistance and 
200 ohms of reactance there, uh, that voltage is going to be a lot higher than 5 or 10 kilowatts with a reasonably low uh, impedance there, That's good, especially that reactive component. So that's why I say a lot of times I do get a lot of people that, you know, they, and maybe it's from the management standpoint and not necessarily, uh, and just some of that is just, you know, from doing it because I do get a lot of engineers that, you know, they've maintained directionals for a long time and they've done a lot of work on, you know, tuning units and this and that, but they just have not been around the diplex case. And sometimes they get a little hesitant until they actually get a little bit of experience with it. Like anything with the AM, I think uh, the more you get exposed to it there, it just kind of gives you a more of a comfort level there that you're not as scared to go out there and actually touch something with the filters or, or look at it there. So. That all makes a lot of sense. And, and the allied question, and of course, you're, you're more on the RF side, but uh, obviously a good question would be, uh, if you have two uh, stations where the harmonics are so close, does this cause great uh, uh, frequency um, response problems? Or can you maintain uh, good audio? Well, on the one out there that I measured out there, uh, and I basically looked at it in a, a 10 kilohertz window on side of carrier there. And uh, if I remember when I when I swept that with the network analyzer, I mean, those the SWRs were, I think, one point maybe two five or less there at 10 kilohertz, which I have a lot of non-D cases that aren't even diplex that are probably much worse than that there, especially on a, a low frequency. So once again, I, it's one of those things where I had to look at those numbers twice. I was like, this actually almost looks too good here, but that's the way it measured. And then fortunately, when you, when we put the transmitters on and modulate them heavy, especially that BE transmitter, if that sideband's not too good, then you usually see that, that reflected power thing moving like a modulation monitor. And the thing was pretty much stayed on zero. So that usually is indicative there that there's fairly reasonable uh, bandwidth. But uh, you're right there. That is a challenge because I've had, uh, you know, uh, things where the in the case where, you know, people have tried different things there and, um, you know, the bandwidth is not so good. Years ago, I came up with a, a Pi filter circuit there, which I've used in some cases where I've had close frequencies to try to keep the bandwidth better. Uh, years ago, uh, Ron Rackley came up with a very, a very good technique, uh, you know, basically looking at the stored energy there, because I remember Ron telling me that one of his professors when he was in, in school there had, you know, talked a lot about looking at stored energy. And I believe in, in his cases there, in, you know, as I do looking at voltages, Ron would basically, you know, look through the whole system and look at where the stored energy was from the antenna back. And basically, if you could basically tailor that, you could improve the performance of that, you know, by quite a bit very quickly. So those techniques over the years, I think have been an important tool um, in not only, you know, yes, we could design probably a past reject filter like five or six different ways, depending on whatever capacitor value we choose uh, and whatever other components we choose in there, but that may or may not be the best case. So that's why, uh, you know, it's not only important, but getting back to the original thing, when you start with a good impedance at the antenna side, it makes life a lot easier. When you're dealing with a bad impedance, it's tough to make it dramatically better, but like using some of the techniques that have been developed and using something like Ron's approach on that stuff there, you can take a situation where you're not, uh, you know, getting, uh, you know, terrible performance there. And that's the whole key is that you want to basically take and, you know, keep it such that uh, you're not disrupting there because a lot of times the host station, you know, they don't want to have decent bandwidth and then us add another station on there and then find out that there's a, a big problem there. All of a sudden their bandwidth is, you know, is terrible, like you mentioned there, Barry. So that's why all those things really need to be looked at there. And, 
that's what I, I usually try to do that. But once again, the ideal situation is starting, you know, with a, uh, you know, a decent impedance there or, and having a known impedance there. And I know, you know, we, we, we added another frequency out there on the West coast there, uh, with Ben Dawson there. And it was, you know, it's very good having measured data because the problem is I get some of these people and they say, well, build us a diplexer there. But if you don't have, you're, you're almost guessing on some of the stuff, if you don't have the measured impedances there. And then all of a sudden, then you get issues where it may or may not have the performance there. And you can't even try to adapt to that there uh, once it's out there in the field, if you don't even have a rough idea. So there's a lot of things. So diplexing, it's a, it's very handy, but there's a lot more behind the scenes there. So people really need to, you know, talk to their, you know, before that's done, they really need to talk to their consulting engineer there and, the more prep work you do on, on doing that up front there, I just think makes the job a lot nicer and a lot smoother in the long run. And also it could save some money because if we know what the impedances are, you know, we may or may not need to have, uh, you know, a certain amount of adjustment range that we would not, if we had to just take a stab in the dark. And then I get in a lot of cases there too, where, People are using, you know, you know, depending if the tower is series fed or, uh, you know, skirted there. And each of those has their all pros and cons, but it really gets back to making sure to try to configure. In reality, like the one in Provo, the slant wire had the best performance that I've seen in a long time, especially on those tight frequencies there. Um, if it were up to me and I was starting from scratch on that tower, thank goodness it was an old station that had a slant wire for a long time, but boy, the performance, I was just impressed of, about the performance of that. So that's why I think in each, each particular case needs to be looked at and see if you can make the antenna better from the beginning, it's going to make things work a lot better. Now, when you get into a directional situation where you're, taking and either, you know, you're diplexing a directional on there or you're taking and you're putting a non-directional on, you know, a DA. I mean, we've done that a lot of cases there. We just did one up in the Boston area where we put, you know, one frequency on, an, on another, on a part of a, an existing array that's got multiple towers. But even in those cases there, and I've had people say, well, we don't, you know, you can just put it on and you don't need to worry about filtering, but, but you do need to worry about filtering because when you have towers on the same property, there's going to be enough induced voltage there uh, coming back there. And also you got to worry about if you're putting a non D on a directional that depending on what the height of those things are, they could affect that pattern very quickly if they they don't have some sort of detuning across them. So when you get in that case, it's not, as simple as the case where you have basically just non-directionals on there with one tower and, but it is getting to be more, we've, I've seen more cases where I've had to, uh, out in the St. Louis area, we're going to be putting a non D on a, an existing directional, but in those cases there, you know, I have to end up detuning the, all the other towers there for it down in, in Houston, we're putting a, you know, a multi uh, element array on another multi, uh, but there's unused towers there. So they have to be detuned there for, uh, for many reasons there, especially since the actual uh, station that's moving to the host station, they're both going to be directional. So that's uh, an important thing there to actually keep in mind when people are looking at that. But once again, my suggestion when I talk to a lot of people is first talk to who does your consulting work, make sure it's going to work, see what their thoughts are on the tower configuration. And then we can work back from there and try to see if we can design the stuff the best we can for not only the bandwidth, like you mentioned, Barry, but also we got to be very careful about the spurious stuff. And once again, with the solid state transmitters, it doesn't take very much to generate a spur very quickly there. Interesting. So. Do you do you find in looking for uh, decent impedances, uh, do you find the need to uh, skirt towers very often or recommend that they take 
the small tower down and build a larger one? Well, I think it each is a case by case situation. Uh, I think if if you have a properly designed skirt there, there there may be some advantages to that uh, where in that particular case, maybe you have some control over what the impedances are by how you design the skirt. Uh, where in the series fed configuration, you're kind of limited there as far as that goes. But if you have a, you know, a fixed skirt on a, on a tower and depending on the electrical height and the geometry, the, especially when you have impedances that vary, uh, frequencies that vary quite a bit, you know, that skirt impedance is, changes very quick, can change very quickly from say 700 kilohertz to 1500 kilohertz there, or even to, a, uh, you know, a couple hundred kilohertz away. So that's the one problem if you have just a, you know, a conventional type skirt on there that uh, you have to be careful. Down in Mobile or Pritchard there outside, uh, outside of Mobile, we have, it's a tall tower. We have the 540 and 1270 diplexed on that. And we did that a number of years back in that we ended up putting a new six wire skirt on there that was spaced fairly far. And I was able to optimize that particular skirt, which was actually, you know, fair, you know, fairly short, like 60 or 70 degrees at the low frequency and over 100 and some degrees there. Uh, so one was inductive and one was capacitive, but actually the impedance has turned out to be very good, but that's not always the case. So to answer your question, I think it really needs to be looked at on a case by case basis, Barry, to see, you know, what would be the best configuration. That makes and sense. I, and I know, and, and I, I know that Ben has done some stuff with some slant wires and I believe the performance of those is very good. Uh, so there's, I think people in this need to look at, see what's going to be their best approach there for, you know, I don't think we can put, we can't say that everybody in each case should go to a, a skirt or go to a series feed. Uh, I mean, if, if the impedance of the series fed tower is very good at the frequencies of interest, then well, maybe then I would keep that. But if it's not, then maybe there's some other avenues to go down. So no, basically, there's no easy answer. You need to look at the situation and analyze it and see what can be done. Exactly. Anyone have a question here? It says uh, one of the chat box things. Um, Diplexing is indeed a balancing act between expense and performance. Tim Sawyer says it's not a cheap option, but given the difficulties of building a new site, an attractive alternative. Let me just uh, add uh, vocally, uh, Kurt, it's good to see you. This is Tim Sawyer. Hey, hey Tim. Good to see you. can turn your camera on, Tim. We can we could enjoy seeing you. Oh, no, 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 no. You don't want to see me without my, uh, without my clean shaven face and uh, my raggedy hair. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> well, it's good. Good. To, good. To, I'm glad that you're on there. So, yeah. But Tim is exactly right, though. Um, no matter what you do with the diplexing stuff, there it's always a juggling act. There, you just gotta you gotta juggle between different things for not only performance, cost, and uh, the mechanical aspect. So it's a juggling act for a lot of different reasons. You know, when clients approach me about diplexing, we look at it, and of course, you know, I'll, it, as you state, you know, the first thing we want is, uh, gee, uh, you got a bridge and uh, a generator. Uh, let's uh, take a look at uh, your antenna and what uh, what uh, my design uh, criteria is going to have to be. What kind of load am I going to be looking into? And then when the, the number of when the when it comes to cost, they are somewhat taken back. When I say, well, you know, these filters and things of this nature, the reject filters, you're looking at probably a minimum of uh, let's say sixty thousand dollars. You know, and they right. and that gives them some pause. Yep, they they do see that there, and I I, I get uh, I get that a lot of times there when they call up and they want to get a rough idea and they say, Oh my goodness there. It's like, but they don't really realize what's involved there that there's, it's not like we're just going to put one box at the tower 
and uh, everything will be just great there. So that is a big concern there, especially among a lot of the stations there. What's the largest number of stations you've uh, multiplexed on one site? Uh, well, we've done, uh, years ago, we did uh, a few for, uh, actually, it was through Alan Dick there for the BBC, where we had you know, four non-Ds there uh, on the same non-directional tower. Um, in the States here, in D.C., we have the four-tower array where we have three stations on there, two of them 50 kilowatts there, and then one at 10 kilowatts, and then a similar situation in San Jose, where that's a four tower array where we have three stations all operating directional on there. But as far as from a, a just a, a frequency standpoint, four would be the uh, basically we've done four. I've done a design on five that we had actually done some work for. It was going to be a station. Uh, overseas there um, but then that never they ended up not building that there but uh, the four was enough there um, <laughs> once you start that. getting above two or three there then i mean it, it gets to be uh, at that point there uh, a bit of a challenge i mean sure anything can be done but it seems to me there that two or three is <laughs> kind of reaching the practical limit there unless you have uh you know, like over in Hawaii and some of those areas, they have, you know, three or four or five on there where you have real problems with towers. But um, I do see a lot of a lot of times here, though, that uh, many and we're and we're doing we're going to be uh, doing another one up there in the uh, in North Jersey there where we already have two on the, the same site there. And we're going to be adding a, a, a third frequency and all those are directional. So um you know, Neil just sent a w note about that that you're about to do that. That's about WPAT, where we have the we have the 930 and the 1430 diplex on there, and those are big old Lehigh self-supporting towers with big top hats on them. Um, and then uh, we're going to be moving that 620 there. So, uh, fortunately, though, in that particular case. And I've had this uh, a, a few different cases. I mean, if you take some of those towers, uh, the self-supporting towers there, you have uh, if they're reasonable height electrically, most a lot of times those impedances are much better than a guide uh, tower, unless you start getting short, then the resistance tends to get fairly low quick, especially with that distributed capacity and stuff across the base. But in Long Island there, we added, they have two big self-supporting towers at the 1100 and we put the 1530 on there and the tower, uh, they're around the quarter wavelength at uh, 1100 there and the towers, I forget, or maybe in the 120 or 130 degree range there at 1530, which if that was just a, a uniform guide tower, that impedance would be pretty high, but there that uh, impedance actually the R was a reasonable number and the, and the reactance was fairly low there. So in that particular case, having a, the self-supporting tower actually worked out much better from an impedance standpoint there in that case, depending on what the heights are. So that's why I say each one is different. I mean, it could have been the opposite way. It could have been that it was short electrically and the resistance was like eight ohms. Then that's another set of problems. So you just never know until you actually go through it there and see what you're dealing with. But I, I get a little bit, the managers are usually the ones that say, well, and which don't really understand what the poor engineers got to go through that, well, why, you know, it's got a 200 foot tower over there. It should be good. Well, <laughs> it may or may not be good. So you really need to have somebody look at it, AKA who does your consulting work and tell you that it's going to be good before you just say that you're going to move over there. And then after that, then you see what's going to be involved to make it work if you're going to go to that spot. So. Chris uh, Hayes says uh, that uh, it seems like every time you add a station, you double the component count. And uh, Andy wants to know, what do you expect to see as a loss in signal level for most modern combiners? Well, at AM frequencies, I don't think the, the loss uh, uh, should not be very dramatic there. If there's a 
a lot of loss in that combiner, then chances are good something's burning up or getting pretty hot there. Um, I haven't found the, the case where there's been a, you know, as far as an efficiency standpoint goes, uh, not a, not in the one, you know, in the AM band, they're a dramatic, not if we're using reasonable components. The other thing too that I've found is performance wise, Typically on a shunt filter there, like if we put a shunt filter on an output of a transmitter, most times there I'll end up using a, a vacuum capacitor in the, if it's a short circuit at the one frequency, because typically those vacuums, the Q is better. So I've ca had cases where I needed a fair amount of rejection and I've tried those same circuits there with a mica which those micas are are good for a lot of reasons because you can they, a from a standpoint of values and this and that but typically the q of those is not nearly as good and with that little bit of series resistance there the attenuation of a shunt filter typically uh, if you have a vacuum in the shall i say the past portion of that there typically you can see a difference in a, a you know four or five dB there compared to if you use the mica compared to a vacuum. Now, the portion of it that resonates it is not nearly as critical. So that's why I say some of the component values, but I have not seen a dramatic insertion effect there as from a, from a loss standpoint there. However, the thing, you know, it will, you got to be careful of because it gets to be misleading sometimes where putting a filter in has changed the impedance. So you may or may not be looking at the same impedance. So your currents there, if you're trying to determine what that power is, they may or they they are going to be different at different parts of the circuit there. In a perfect world, they would not be, but that's uh, there's enough stuff that's introduced there that you have to be very careful of how that's measured. So, um, but to answer that, I don't, I have not seen uh, stuff we've measured there. Uh, very little and noticeable loss going through the filter stuff. The biggest issue with the filtering stuff is the uh, the bandwidth the constraints there as far as it affecting the performance of the bandwidth if it's not designed correctly there. That's one of the big limitations there. Now I had a uh, email here, I can't find it at the moment, but it, it requested you to talk about a horror story in Chicago. Um, a, a diplex that you did up there issues or maybe he just wants to know how it came out uh was this a, a recent i did have to go up there and uh do a little bit of retuning on an auxiliary site we have up on belmont there um vertical bridge was putting up some it's a that's a big tower it's a 500 foot self-supporting tower that's literally got a building around the base of it there it's got skirts on it there. We had to add a skirt for the 670 and the 780. Um, it had another frequency on there, which has a skirt on there, which I don't believe is still being used, which would have been nice to actually get rid of that there because uh, we had to put some filtering in for that other station, which didn't help the bandwidth. But we did, uh, there was some issues with uh, getting those transmitters to run there. Once again, it was more so of a bandwidth issue there. And also there was some issues with the, uh, on the tower side there where somebody had climbed on the feed there and the arc gap was pretty close to there. So we ran it with full modulation. The thing was arcing inside the output there of the diplexer, which we were able to straighten that up. So, um, but that was a few months back, so uh, I'm not sure if that uh, is what uh, we're referring to or not, Barry. So. Okay. I, unfortunately, I can't find that uh, email. Uh, I only get 750 a day, so. But that, uh, yeah, but that, that, like I said, I mean, and and that's the, the problem when you have some of these diplex sites, too, um, depending if you have somebody else that owns the tower and they have other stuff on there, not all not they don't always pay attention to the diplexing equipment there and i think they were using some of our diplexer cabinets as a stand to climb up onto the tower there and i i went out with their engineer a while uh, this was some years ago after it was first done and apparently the tower guys had come in there 
and they stood on it and they actually twisted the feet around and shorted out the horn gap there so the transmitter wouldn't run period there and there was a big dent on top of the cabinet and i thought to myself uh, i'm not sure why would you i guess that was the most convenient spot there to climb onto the tower there it just used the the, the diplex or cabinets that were underneath there so, but that's always a challenge at, at sites that people don't own themselves. When there's other people going to a lot of these AM sites, I, I see it only too often that people just don't uh, take care or maybe don't understand what's involved with the stuff that's down there for the AM. So, Kirk, let me uh, ask you this question. I have my own personal uh, guideline, but I'd be curious about how how close an adjacent frequency would you go? Would it be uh, 60 kilohertz? Well, I think that that's probably doable if it's in the upper half of the band. Um, but typically, uh, I, I shoot for 100 kilohertz there. Um, but I guess it really depends if it's at the if it's at the upper half of the band. I, we've done a few where. Uh, actually, for the BBC, we did some that were 60 and 70 kilohertz apart there that were in the middle to upper half of the band. So I think that's a, a realistic number there. Um, once again, I guess if the if it's a reasonable impedance there, the advantage of having them close frequencies is that if you want to tailor that impedance before the two tie together, you can really optimize that because they're very similar. Um but the, the, the drawback is just making sure to have enough attenuation in the filters without destroying the bandwidth. But I think that's probably a, a reasonable assumption there. Um, but I would say that we'd probably, you know, in some cases, it's not always more is better, but from the filtering standpoint, more is better. But I, I, I normally suggest 100 kilohertz, but I because uh, I try to kind of average it throughout the band there. But I think, uh, you know, 50 or 60 kilohertz gets to be kind of the tightest limitation that I've seen there. Well, you know, as you can imagine, Ron Rackley and I have had a, a number of conversations about how tight we could go. And we had kind of settled on that 60, but with the, you know, uh, caution that, that we would have to uh, beef up the reject uh considerably uh yeah and i think that uh, and i and i try not to brute force it and i think even if you even if you don't on a couple of the cases where we've had 50 or 60 even if we didn't take and you know i i was trying not to get all the attenuation out at the actual tower base there i said well let's get as much as we can and let's keep that a reasonably high impedance so that we don't have any shunning effect looking backwards to the other frequency. And then let's deal with some of that. And I put like one of my pie filters up at the transmitter there where uh, I was able to maintain a reasonably good uh, bandwidth and, and get a decent amount of uh, attenuation there. So I figured let's not try to brute force it that way. And I even Ron and I did discuss that when I one year out at the NAB when I had that pie filter there that, you know, let's not try to brute force it there. And I think that makes a lot of sense to him there. So, uh, uh, but I, I think that's doable, but once again, there, hopefully the impedance is if it's real high at the one frequency, then chances are good to be real at the other, then it could be a nightmare. But if it's a good impedance there, then that makes a lot of sense there. What you said. Yeah. So. And the other point, of course, is that uh, for this audience uh, that's uh, listening to you today, and we're all enjoying it, but I, the, the bottom line is uh, that it's almost always better if the host free, host station is the lower frequency. Yeah, that has its advantage, uh, many advantages. Yeah, so, um, but typically, I, I run into a lot of customers where they just don't have choices there, and they're forced to go to somewhere which is not always the most desirable, but it's what they have to deal with there. And uh, so that's why we try to work around it the best we can there. So that's why each one is, as you well know, always a challenge there. So you just can't lump too many of them together there because so going back to my original uh, earlier thing, a lot of times I've thought ones were going to be easy and they turned out to be the most difficult there. So, um, 
But I think a lot of that, and once again, having, you know, the stations deal with their consultant there up front there, which, you know, I'll get owners that'll just call the office there. Well, we need a diplexer. I'm like, well, what do you need? If, you know, what's the details? Well, we don't know, but we know we need it. I'm like, well, I think you need to talk to somebody first before you get to the point where you're calling me. So, um, but we try to help that out. And I try to uh, tell them that they need to talk to their consulting engineer and figure out what you're going to do before you start spending a lot of time. And also, you know, I don't want to waste the time and do a design on a diplex or to give them a quote if it's they find out that they can't even operate from that site there. That makes no sense to anybody. So, yeah. Now you've been involved with uh, uh, a lot of different uh, stations. I, I know the one uh, at WLS that they have, uh, or at least they did have during the reconstruction of, of the other station, their filter and combining network was a building that was something on the order of 40 by 50, if I remember correctly, huge building full of uh, capacitors and coils and things. So these things can get uh, quite uh, quite large, can't they? Yeah, I mean, in Chicago there, we have the, uh, we moved the WBBM, the uh, 780 over to the, uh, the old WMAQ, the WSCR site, the 670 in Glendale Heights. And that stuff, I mean, it, it takes up, we have, you know, 12 by 30 buildings at, at the main and Ox towers there. And that's full of, you know, cabinets that we have in a row there with that stuff. And that was another particular challenge too, because if you look at those frequencies there, then you look at the spur frequencies. I think when I looked at the spur frequencies, one of them's 560, which is W I N D. One of them was 890. <laughs> And then the other one was, I think, 1000, the old WCFL there, the WNVP there. So we had spur frequencies from those two, from those two that were right on stations that were out there. And I remember looking at that and that the five, the 560 WIND is way south of Chicago. It's 40 or 50. It's probably 20, well, maybe 30, 40 miles away. It's a long ways, whatever that is. And I was impressed, though, that we had that, this, the, with not brute forcing that, but with the filtering I had in there, I mean, outside, right by the tower there, I mean, literally 100 yards from the tower, I could listen to WIND right in the truck radio there. So, um, but that gets to be another challenge, just trying to measure those uh spur frequencies when you got stations uh, especially in some of these metropolitan markets that are all all those frequencies there and it's not like people are really willing to shut that stuff off in the middle of the day the measure so that gets to be a challenge uh, in making sure that those are down but uh, murphy's law is there yeah i think that turned out at least three of them were on stations there that were right out there so that's usually the way it works out there when you start having that stuff in urban areas you got to be careful that you know that you don't generate a spur that's right on the over top of another you know am station that's right in the market there so i know it's a little bit off uh, the topic of diplexing but i know that you have been involved with uh, grady in the heba antenna and uh, i assume also with the other station that he saved where they lost their tower site and all they could do is put up a long wire and uh, get it going. Uh, anything that you uh, uh, have on mind about uh, that uh, low angle antenna? Thing? Matt, we've done some, some, some work on that there. We're continuing to do that. Uh, it's just that as Grady had mentioned, when we were talking earlier, everybody's just been so darn busy that we really haven't had the opportunity to, <laughs> it, it's one of those things where it's hard enough to do what we need to during the day. It just seems like there's not enough hours. So we haven't really pursued that there, but that's something that uh, Grady and I got some stuff that we are uh, going to be doing on that. So, But you actually have arranged for an antenna. Uh, this is sort of mid-band, if I remember correctly, that takes up much less space than most. Correct. Correct. And, um, you know, once again, it, you know, performance uh, seems to be is very good. So, uh, but we're always trying to improve things and maybe come up with some of that stuff there. But 
uh, we've just been so busy here and I've been spending a lot of time, you know, with the diplexing and, and, the, and the stuff that we've been doing here, that it's just been a little bit difficult to get to that, but we will uh, get back into that there as soon as we're able to there. So. There are some uh, regulatory issues. Um, we're at a point where getting the government to accept the next steps that we need to take technically with the development of that amplifier can't be made until the FCC comes to final decisions and issues certain um, uh, regulatory adjustments, if you will, that allow us to go forward. And uh, we're getting closer on that, but until, um, until we get some action from the FCC, uh, we're really kind of sitting here uh, in neutral with our engines running, ready to do something, and uh, we can't do anything while we wait. And of course, COVID comes along, and uh, everybody's out a lot, and um, it, it's it's hard to get anything done in any part of this industry, much less in a regulatory environment where it's not uh, considered within the regulatory department to be of a primary importance. So, you know, uh, sooner or later, something will happen that will allow us to put our machine in gear again and move forward. Uh, Kurt's certainly busy. I'm certainly busy. Uh, but it's more than us being busy. It's uh, the FCC being busy. So there you go. Absolutely. And as we come up to the top of the hour here, and I know, Kurt, you have uh, other things you may want to go or you're welcome Certainly not chasing you away, but uh, anyone else have a question uh, or comment for Kurt? Some something you'd like to know about diplexing or triplexing? Something you'd while like? While I've to been talking, um, I'll, I will bring up something. Um, I'm having to work with several different uh, multiplexed arrays, and one of the problems that I've discovered that I don't hear people talking about is that. Uh, when Kurt brought up the concept of these newer solid state transmitters can be more problematic because of their designs. There's an area that I haven't heard anyone mention, which is uh, most of these new solid state designs take a sample of the RF output of the transmitter. Uh, and many of them take a voltage sample and a current sample and don't do anything with them at all, except shove them into two different high bandwidth inputs directly into an analog to digital converter and take that information into the computer part of the transmitter to calculate what the VSWR is. And these voltage and current samples within the transmitter have no band limiting in them at all. They're basically broadband samples. Whatever voltage and whatever current is there gets shoved into those analog to digital converters and then the transmitter does strange things because when the manufacturer builds these transmitters, they're running them into a dummy load. There's nothing else there. And of course it works really, really well. But you take that transmitter and you put it in the field with, for example, a 50 kilowatt, a 25 kilowatt and a 20 kilowatt signal on five towers, then all that leakage RF from the other two transmitters and the intermod products are showing up uh, at those uh, sample inputs to the uh, computer in the transmitter. And the transmitter says, oh my goodness, I'm doing this. I have to fix that. And then the transmitter starts trying to fix something that it has no control over. And then things start blowing up. I guess the moral of that is that you just don't throw things together willy-nilly. You think it through with your consultant and with Kurt. And I think that goes back to, yeah, keeping those voltages out is very a very tricky situation, and that's what really needs to happen with the, uh, especially like Grady said, with these newer, newer transmitters there, not only in their performance, but in the way they sense things there. So it's not a perfect world, but you can just do the best you can to try to keep some of that unwanted voltages out of there. I'm not sure how else you can do deal with it and just, uh, you know, take it one step at a time. And if you got another, try to find out what, what voltages are coming, because 
I've had some cases where we diplex something and the transmitter, you know, was seeing some other voltages, but it wasn't from the ones that were at that site. It was from a station that was like a, a mile or a couple of miles away. So that's why, you know, as I mentioned earlier, people got to look at not only what's going to be on the site there, but to see if there's other stations nearby, because you might not only have to have a bunch of filters for the stations that are on the site, but you might have to have some transmitter filters for ones that are fairly close by too. So. Well, it's interesting how you can get into a, such a complex arrangement. Uh, but even at the non-directional tower, uh, there are so many uh, guys that have a non-D and they have never measured it. They've never looked inside that. Don't have the tools to do so. And these are all things that I'd like to have you come back and discuss another time. Be happy to. So it was very good to talk to uh, everyone. So I'm, I'm hope that I was uh, helpful in some way and uh, be happy to help out any way we can. So, Well, I've got several comments here in the chat box and elsewise in email saying that they really enjoyed this uh, discussion. And thank you for the uh, illumination. Very good. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you. Well, that leaves the floor open. Uh, let's see. Tim Sawyer mentions a 90 degree tower at 930 is 138 degrees at 1430. Okay, but only 60 degrees at 620. That's uh, really stretching it, isn't it, Tim? Is that the Washington one? I don't know. Whoops, just realized I was still muted. What I started to say was that the 620 uh at only 60 degrees is going to have a very low uh driving impedance uh and so and also suffer from uh you know just uh overall radiation uh, efficiency would be you know down six uh, 60 degree towers are just a you know not a good thing yeah one of the very first uh, ones that i engineered was a 1330 with a very short stick and the uh Base impedance was, you know, like 15 ohms or something like that. Yeah, it starts getting down into that 10, 12, 15 ohm deal. This is the same thing that we get with, uh, you know, these uh, uh, Velcom antennas that are, uh, you know, uh, base loaded or, or center loaded and things like that. The drive imp they're short towers and they're, they work fine for their purpose, but uh, bandwidth is always an issue. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Neil reminds us that the 620, uh, 930, and 1450 is KWPAT and WNSW in uh, in Jersey there. Uh, Tim, I was thinking too in, in terms of putting these things together and uh, doing the engineering for them. Uh, when you have a client approach you, do you caution them at first or do you stop and say, well, it's going to cost you. You know, one of the first things that happens is that, is that I, you know, we find out what they're who, who they want to host with or or who's approached them, and uh, uh, as Kurt said, I mean, you know, first we have to check to see whether allocation wise it's even a fit. In other words, you can move from one side of the town to the other side of the town and, and all of a sudden have a contour overlap. So, does the site work allocation wise? And then we look at whether it, you know, it fits. One of the criteria, just you know, to cut is that I don't want to talk to. I don't want to talk. There's no point in engaging me even to look at it if it's less than 60 kilohertz away, as uh, as previously stated. Mm -hmm. And uh, if the towers, uh, you know, if the uh, electrical length of the towers at the various frequencies seem like a good match, uh, or a reasonable, uh, you know deal i there's always going to be a compromise and that's why i said it's always better that if you're looking at moving to a another tower that hopefully it's a lower frequency than you are i'll add i'll add one uh, factor here that we didn't ask kurt about but uh, maybe you would uh, address it briefly negative towers 
Well, they're the <laughs> same as positive towers. They, the ones that are difficult are the ones that don't know which way they are. Yeah, I, I had one at a six tower uh, array that uh, wandered through zero under modulation. Yeah, exactly. And and that's a problem. And uh, it's kind of like, and if you're if it's a directional array, well, it's obviously a directional array, but it, you know, it's kind of like, and you'll see the phase flip and all of this other stuff and you'll go, what is going on here? And it's because the tower has gone either is a negative tower and it's now gone the positive side or, you know, vice versa. It's just too close. I mean, I absolutely have run into some beasts that are, that were, I'll, I'll, I'll say they weren't designed by me, but designed by others that had drive points uh, in the design of, you know, three ohms. And I'm going, but this is just going to be not good. Either make it really negative or, you know, <laughs> uh, rethink this thing. I mean, you know, we have to go through a, a, you know, double step down, you know, to get any kind of match. In other words, you don't want to go through a, like an ATU. You don't want to go through, you know, a two, more than greater than a two to one change in impedance. 